Thank you, man. James tells us there are times in our lives as a believer when we are to pray, and he tells us that there are also times when we are to sing praises. With that in mind, go with to the book of James chapter 5, and we'll read the verse that states that. James 5 verse 13. Is any among you afflicted, meaning suffering or in trouble in all types? Let him pray. Is any merry or happy or cheerful? Let him sing psalms. So we ask, what is this actually saying? What is this actually telling us? And what do I mean that there are times when we are called to pray and a time when we are to sing psalms or praises to God. I have entitled this sermon, A Time to Pray and A Time to Praise. So I want us to look at some examples of times when we are to pray and to sing psalms or praises to our God. In verse 13, we just read, we find in times of affliction or suffering or times of trouble that we are to pray. That's what we read. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. And so we ask the question, what kind of suffering? What kind of affliction? What kind of trouble is James writing about? This word is actually referring to suffering or affliction or troubles of any kind. There is no limit. It's talking about any kind of troubles, any kind of affliction, any kind of suffering that you might be or we might be going through. It could be caused by sickness. It could be caused by disappointment. It could be caused by grief and loss and mourning because of the lost the death of a loved one or a close friend. It could be because of loss of health or property or job or persecution or on and on and on. It refers to suffering evil of any kind. And James later in the same chapter deals with sickness. So it's kind of a separate issue there. So we are told when we are suffering some type of affliction or trouble that we might be going through, it says that we're to pray. So I want us to take a look at this topic a little more. It seems very obvious that prayer is appropriate in times of trials. I think we also all already understand and know that only God can remove the real source of the sorrow. Only God can grant us happiness out of all of our afflictions. Only God can make them the way of sanctifying or setting, setting us apart in any way. Go with me to the book of Psalms. Psalm 107, beginning in verse 6. 107, verse 6. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. Verse 13. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. Verse 28. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he brings them out of their distresses. And here's the point. Here's a, a, a really interesting point about all of this that we need to see. And I want us to see it from the very beginning. The form of the trial. In other words, the manner, what the trial is, makes no difference. God is there. You know, there's no indication in this Psalm 107, these three different verses that we've read, 
what the trouble was. So the form, the manner, what the trial really is makes no difference. Because, brethren, a very important point for us to understand is it is a blessing to go to God in prayer. I mean, where else are we going to go? We can work it out, try and work it out on our own, or we can go to God. Let me see. Which one do we think is the better one to do? I know that we all understand that our health fails. We all understand that family and friends die. We lose things that are close, that are very dear to us. Disappointments happen. Danger threatens us. Death approaches all of us. We're told it's appointed unto man once to die in the judgment. And we know that we can only go to God for real lasting help and deliverance. One purpose for our affliction, one purpose. There are others, I'm focusing on one. One purpose for our afflictions in this life is to lead us to God's throne of grace. He's in charge. He's in charge of our life. And brethren, when we really get this and when we really understand this, there is a happy result of our trials when they lead us to seek God in prayer. He shows us the best remedy against all affliction, all afflictions, troubles, sufferings, troubles, all of those things we talked about and used as words earlier, is through prayer. Prayer has a place in both sorrow and joy. Now, I've only been focusing on the sorrow part. So I make this jump into the middle of this and make this statement. Prayer has a place in both sorrow and joy. And that leads us to a question. And the question is, so what should we pray for? Well, I'm going to mention two, and I'm going to number them because, it, again, I've said this before, it helps me to keep up where I am. One of the things that we pray for is, is we, re re we pray for the removal of the suffering according to God's will in our lives. We'll see a little bit about this in just a moment, what I'm talking about. Go with me to 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 9, I mean verse 8. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 8. For this thing I, Paul, sought the Lord thrice, three different times, that it might depart from me. So here he's suffering, and he asked God to remove it. That's what he says. And we already know that it was not God's will to remove it. Verse 9, and he, God, said unto me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, do I, or will I, Paul, rather glory in my afflictions that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Wow. So the first thing that we pray for is, is we pray for God to remove the affliction, the trouble, the suffering, the trial, the whatever it is that's going on according to his will for our life. I mean, not going into detail, but what if there's a, and I say that tongue in cheek because we know there is, what if there is a godly purpose for us going through it? And the point is, there is. There is. But we still go to God and ask God to remove it, knowing that God's in charge of our life. And his will be done. Okay, and then we're going to move on. The second thing 
that we are to pray for as we go through suffering and afflictions and trials is the strength to be able to endure the suffering so we can bear with it, so we can bear up under it, so we can go through it. I mean, if he's going to allow it to happen, he, God, is going to allow it to happen, and he's going to allow it to continue, at least for a while, then we need to pray for the ability to be able to go through it, to endure the affliction that we're going through, according to God's will. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There has no temptation taken you such, but is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer, not allow you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Or as is probably better translated, that you will be able to bear up under it or that you will be able to go through it. I want us to please realize, brethren, God may not always remove the source of our suffering as it might be for our ultimate good. We go, oh, wait a minute. How can any kind of suffering be for ultimate good? It's according to God's will. He has things we need to learn. He needs the things we need to go through to shape and mold us, to become what he wants us to be so that we will fit in the body where it pleases him. That's about as simply as I know how to state. Go with me to Psalm 119, and we're going to read three different verses here. Psalm 119, verse 67. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept thy word. Now, there's a lot to say there without saying it. And obviously, is God used some affliction to bring him back to him. Still in Psalm 119, verse 71. It is good for me that I have been afflicted so that I might learn your statutes. Oh, in other words, we should be praying more and digging in and finding out what it is as God might want us to be learning during all of this. Yeah, yeah, exactly what I'm saying, because exactly what this verse is saying. In verse 75, I know, O oh Lord, that your judgments are right. In other words, however you deal with the situation, you're right. You're right. You're in charge of my life. And whatever you do, you're right in a way it's handled. And that you and faithfulness have afflicted me. You love me enough that you afflict me so that you will shape and mold me to fit in the body where it pleases you. Where else would we want to fit than where God wants us to fit? We also need to realize that he promises to help us to endure, to go through the situation. We just read that. It's in back in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13. So it leads me now to another question, and that is, who should we pray for? Well, Obviously, according to James 5 and verse 13, we need to obviously pray for ourselves. That's what James is telling us. We also know that as Jesus taught, we are to pray for those who may be the source of our suffering. This is where... Uh, I'm, I, this is just coming to my mind in a way to say it. It's not in my notes. This is where real Christianity, real living, the godly way of life really gets, comes into being. When we pray for those who are the source of our suffering. Go with me to Luke 6 and verse 28. Luke 6, 28. Bless them that curse you. I didn't write this. 
I'm just reading it. Pray for them which despitefully use you. You see, brother, by praying for those who despitefully use us, are those who cause us the suffering, this can help us greatly to endure the suffering. And maybe that's exactly what God is wanting us to do. To pray for somebody else, to focus on somebody else and not so much on me. And so he allows, I'm not saying he does it like this, but I'm reading these verses and I come to the conclusion to go, oh, so we pray for those who despitefully use us. Well, what if that's the cause? What if that's the reason that we're going through it? Because they need to be prayed for. So quite simple, in times of suffering, let us pray. It is an incredible blessing to pray. But whatever the purpose is, the purpose is of why we're praying to our great God. We're to be praying to him, and it is to be bringing glory and honor, lifting him up for who and what he is, because we're acknowledging we know who he is. We're going through trials. We're asking blessings you know, for thankful for food that we have, We're, whatever the situation, good, bad, and the ugly, we pray about it. And it is an incredible blessing to pray. And brother, when this is rightly understood, it is a great source of comfort when we are afflicted. When we really understand that, there's a lot more to that. But I want to go back to James and see that other thing that we're looking at. In times of cheerfulness, let us sing praises. That's what it says in James 5, verse 13 in the B part. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. The word merry or cheerful is referring to times of pleasantness. It's referring to times of agreeableness. It implies a state of mind that is free from trouble. Now, we're going to see a little bit more about this very, very quickly here. It is also the opposite of affliction. It is happy. In this state of cheerfulness or happiness, we're to sing praises. Why? Well, putting it as simple again as I can get, because singing praises to God is what his children do. Do we have to have any other reason? Well, we're going to see. Let's go on. I want us to notice the attitude of David. Was David who a man that went through times of trouble and suffered and all of that? Yeah. Was David a man who also sang praises to God even when he was going through times of trouble? Yes. So go with me to Psalm 92, Psalm 92, verse 1. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High, to show forth your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every night. What was he going through when he wrote this song? Let's move on. I'm just asking the question. You can look it up and see. Psalm 96, verse 1, 96, verse 1. Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth, meaning everyone, everywhere. Verse 2, sing unto the Lord, bless his name, show forth his salvation from day to day. Psalm 101 and verse 1, Psalm 101, verse 1. I will sing of mercy and judgment unto thee, O Lord, 
will I sing? Psalm 111 and verse 1. We read this at the beginning of our services. Praise you the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. Psalm 113. Am I driving a point home here? Absolutely. Psalm 113 verse 1. Praise you the Lord. Praise, O oh, you servants of the Lord. Duh, put your name there. That means us. Praise the name of the Lord. Bless be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun and to the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. I'm not done. Psalm 146, verse 1. Psalm 146, verse 1. Praise you, the Lord. Praise to the Lord, O oh, my soul. While I live, will I praise the Lord. I will sing praises unto my God while I have my being, while I'm alive, while I'm above the dirt. I'm going to praise God. Psalm 147 and verse 1. Praise you, the Lord, for it is good to sing praises unto our God, for it is pleasant and praise is comely. Psalm 149 in verse 1. Praise the Lord. Sing unto the Lord a new song and his praise in the congregation of saints. We are told in scripture, that David was a man after God's own heart. He sang praises to God. Should not we do the same? I mean, after all, think about it this way. Singing praises has the power to make a good situation even better. Now, with that in mind, please go with me to the book of Colossians. Colossians 3, beginning in verse 10. Colossians 3 and verse 10. You have put on the new man. Who's this talking about? Us, the church. Now, I know particularly it's referring to the Colossians, but hey, it's describing us too. You have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body, and be you thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom and teaching and admonishing one another and psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. He just tied praying and singing praises together. He just tied in together singing praises and honor and glory to God during times when we are praying, when we're going through suffering. Reread it if you don't think that's what he's saying. I want us to notice an example. We all, we all know this, but I want us to take a look at it. The example is of Paul and Silas. This is a time when they had been arrested, they had been beaten, and they were thrown into a jail cell in Philippi. And we find this in Acts chapter 16. So let's go to Acts 16, beginning in verse 20. Acts 16 and verse 20, and brought them, them as Paul and Silas, to the magistrate, saying, These men, being Jews, 
do exceedingly trouble our city. <laughs> what was the exceedingly troubling our city all about? They were preaching Jesus. They were preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of the salvation of the coming Savior, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. But they exceedingly trouble our city. But keep going. And there's an inferred. And they were teaching customs which are not lawful us to receive, neither to observe being Romans. Now, what is he saying there without really saying it? Interesting words, because it was against Roman law to teach Jesus. I point this out because do any of us think that the time may be coming when it would be against the law for us to preach Jesus? And if it does, what are you going to do? We're going to preach Jesus. Verse 22, and the multitude rose together against Paul and Silas. I'm reading it. It said them. And the magistrate ran off their coat. This is a little dramatic, right? And commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks? And at midnight, Paul and Silas Yeah, I'm pausing for effect. Prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. This phrase, and the prisoners heard them, is not simply stating their singing was loud enough that they could be heard. No, it's saying with intense listening. They were paying attention. The sense is the prisoners were really listening to what Paul and Silas were saying as they were singing. They were paying attention to what was being said. That's what the words are telling us. Continuing on in verse 26. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's and everyone's bonds who are the ones all the prisoners included Paul and Silas all the prisoners bonds were loose wow so i have like a really dumb question here do you think god was listening And the keeper of the prison awakened out of his sleep and seeing that the prison doors were open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had fled. Now, if you're in chains and you're in prison and suddenly the door just swings open, what are you going to do? You're probably going to run. That's what the jailer assumed. But Paul cried with a loud voice saying, do a loud voice saying, do not harm yourself, for we are Paul and Silas, we're still here. It's not what it says. For we are all here. All are here. Then he, the jailer, called for a light and sprang in and came trembling.
when they were delivered out of their troubles. And they were singing praises, even though they were in a very, very bad situation. Here's my point. We can at least sing praises when we are in a merry heart situation, right? Right. Now, with what we have seen, what is this? Why is it that it sometimes, as believers, we do not sing praises more often and more passionately? Why is that? Well, let me ask some questions for us to consider, for us to think about. Number one, this is asking, this is trying to questions as to why there are sometimes that we don't sing more praises to God and more passionately sing praises to God. Number one, are we that afflicted that we cannot? Just asking. Number two, hasn't God been good enough and done enough in our lives to prompt us to praise him fervently in singing praises to him, no matter what the situation is? And a third question is, what excuse can we possibly give for refusing to praise God for his glory and his love and his righteousness for who and what he is? What excuse can we give not to do so? Go with me to Psalm 100 and verse 1. Psalm 100 and verse 1. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all you lands, implying everyone, everywhere. No one is left out. And brethren, I'm going to state here, I'm going to state it here because I've heard this before. You have to. Please do not use the excuse that we cannot sing because God commands all to sing. And unless we are mute, the command implies to each and every one of us. We're to make a joyful noise. This verse, I want us to understand, is structured in such a way that it is a command. It is not a suggestion. It's not a suggestion. The words make a joyful noise. I want us to understand this. This is translated from a Hebrew tune to from a Hebrew term. Uh, Ruah. It's uh it's spelled W A, I mean R U W A. And it comes from a primitive phrase meaning to mar, M-A-R, especially by breaking. Now that's what the word comes from. In other words, it means to split the ears with sound, with shouting for an alarm or for joy, it is to shout and applause, to cry out in triumph. The sense of it is a sound so loud that it actually hurts the ears. Make a joyful noise. That's what the phrase in Hebrew actually means. It means to make a joyful noise to the Lord. In other words, it is one of those dynamic, one of those enthusiastic, one of those spirited words that come straight from the heart. You're just screaming it out, crying it out, you know, from the Lord. I'm going to give you an illustration. I'm not going to do it, but... I want to give you an illustration. And the illustration is, if you saw the movie Braveheart, just before they go into battle, brethren, that was Ruach. 
That's what that was. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not implying that it was saying that they were praising God. It's not what I'm saying. However, what I am saying is that it was one of those dynamic, enthusiastic, spirited sounds that came straight from the heart. And we are told that we are to praise God, to make a joyful noise. I can't sing. What does that have to do with anything? Now, thankfully, God is not so concerned with how it sounds as much as he is that it is coming from the heart. Therefore, all who can sing, all who can speak, rather, can and should sing. Now, go with me to Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians 5, 17. Ephesians 5, therefore, 17. Wherefore, or therefore, be you not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Now, we've already talked about the will of the Lord. We're to be praying, and we're praying out of tribulation, out of troubles, out of distresses, and we pray it according to God's will. Well, we've already talked about, well, what if God allows us to stay in there because he's shaping and molding us to fit where he wants us to be? Great. And so what do we do? We sing praises to him. Therefore, be you not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine where is in excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to your heart, in your heart to the Lord. We need to understand. Maybe. Perhaps. Singing praises to God. Is just as important as is praying to God. It's a question. Now, I stated it as a statement, but I have it as a question. So I ask, do you think it is possible our prayers would be answered more often if we would praise God more often? even in times of trouble. Back in James chapter 5, I'm not going back there, but it deals with sickness, and I said, that's another issue, and God willing, maybe we can cover this next part at a later time, at a later sermon. But brethren, I want us to understand when we look at James 5.13, we see the main idea, the main teaching is that both, both prayer and singing praises are to be very special blessings for all of us as true believers. I don't know how you can come away thinking that that's not the, that, that's not the idea, that's not really the teaching that is being stated here. To put it very simple, there should never be a time in our lives when we are not doing at least one or the other or both. What do you mean at all times in our lives? It says over here, we just read it. Let me go back to that verse and I'll reread it. And it says, Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to your in your heart to the Lord. Yet, there should never be a time in our lives when we are not doing at least one or the other or both at all times. I want us to be very careful 
and not underestimate the importance of singing praises to God and underestimate the importance of the power of prayer. For us to truly, truly benefit from these two spiritual blessings, and yes, there are others, I only focused on two here today, we need to be in a right relationship with God. And of course, this involves being open to God's word. Psalm 28 and verse 9, Psalm 28, I, I mean uh, Proverbs 28, Proverbs 28 and verse 9. And I'm going to read this from the New American Standard Bible. He that turns away his ear from hearing the law, meaning the word of God, even his prayer is an abomination. Huh. Because you see, brethren, praise declares God's nature. Who and what he really is. Psalm 7, verse 17. Psalm 7, verse 17. I will praise the Lord according to your righteousness. And I will sing, and when, and when it says I hear, we need to put our name there. Make this very personal. I, put your name there. I will sing praises to the name of the Most High. Not going there, but we know that in Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 1, we are told, we are told, to everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under the heaven. I want to conclude by making this statement. I want us to understand, I want to go, us to go away from the sermon today realizing and declaring and stating it is always the season. It is always the correct it is always the right time to pray and to sing praises to our awesome, loving God. Right. Right. There is a time to pray and a time to praise. The ironic blessing. Oh, and there's so much more to this topic. I left out a whole bunch of the, of the passages that we could have read. But let's go to the ironic blessing. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and to his sons, saying, On this wise you shall bless the children of Israel, saying unto them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. We are blessed. We are so blessed. And we're to pray, and we're to praise our great God all the time. And that heart and that attitude because of who he is. God bless you all. Happy Sabbath.